Welcome! We are finally ready to discuss causality in the free Klein-Gordon theory. Now, this is a very, very important topic because as I will show you in just a few moments, causality, right, the fact that we need to be able to determine whether a certain event in space-time can be causally linked or basically can a certain event have caused a certain different event based on how far apart they are in space-time. So that's uh, one of the most important concepts in, re in uh, special relativity. And we want to apply it, of course, to our quantum theory. And as we will see, that used to be an issue in quantum mechanics, but it is one of the things that we will solve in quantum field theory. And the way that we will solve it is actually very interesting. Rather, it has already been solved by, by just uh, creating this theory, but it's going to be very, very interesting to see the implications of what we will get. So stay with me and we will get there. So let's just do a quick reminder. So in quantum mechanics, right? So in just regular non-relativistic, so non-relativistic relativistic quantum mechanics, we had the amplitude for a free particle that would propagate from a certain point x0 to x. And as you might recall, it looked precisely like this. And here, now let's do the case where we have a free particle, right? So that means that the Hamiltonian is going to be p squared over 2m, right? So this is a non-relativistic particle. Let's just plug this in. So we get ra x e to the minus i p squared t over 2m x0. Okay, so now we want to work around with this a little bit. So let's now use the completeness relation here. So that right there is the completeness relation that we learned in quantum mechanics, and we now want to apply it to what we have here. So we have, let's now put the integral here, right? So d3p, then we have bra of x. We will still have our x exponential here, so e to the minus i p squared t over 2m. And now come this or these two p terms right here. And then we have x0. So here we need to determine two quantities. So xp, right? So the inner product of x and p, which we already know. This is something that we have seen in quantum mechanics. This is 1 over 2 pi cubed e to the i p x. Now let's make sure that 3 looks like a 3. And similarly, if we now want to take p, um, that's supposed to be like this, so bra of p ket of x0, we can just take the complex conjugate of this, if you don't want to rem remember it separately. And by doing that, we get 1 over 2 pi cubed e to the minus i p, and now instead of x, we have x0. So now plugging this back into the amplitude u of t, well, what do we have? So this would be still our integral, so integral here, d3p, and then we have this uh, bra x ket p, which we already uh, saw here is e to the i p x divided by 2 pi cubed. Then we have the other exponent, so e to the minus i p squared t divided by 2m, and then we have, let's see the this part right here. So let's switch back to blue, and we have e to the minus i p x zero divided by two pi cubed. Okay, so this is the expression that we now are left with. And now let us just put all the constants uh, outside of the integral. So we have one over two pi to the sixth, and then we integrate. So we have d three p. Maybe let's stick to the same color. So we have d3p, and now we can combine all of the exponents into one, right? So we have e to the, let's see, let's put the p squared first. So we have minus i p squared t over 2m. And then we have these two that we can just factor out. We can write as, a, as ip x minus x0, so plus. All right, so that is what this now looks like. So if we want to study this expression and see what happens with the amplitude here and therefore study causality in quantum mechanics, just as a quick reminder, 
um, we need to see what's going on with this interval. Now, what is the key here? The key is to keep in mind or notice that this actually looks a whole lot like a Gaussian integral, which is exactly what I have right here. So a Gaussian integral is one that goes from minus infinity to infinity, which is exactly what's going on here, right? We're integrating in three dimensions. So we have px, py, pz. Each one goes from minus infinity to infinity. We can take any possible value there. And the we have in the, uh, in the integrand e to the minus something times the variable of integration squared. So in this case, we have p squared, but we also have this annoying term. So we can't really use this right away. Otherwise, it would be very easy. So what we need to do is going to be to complete the square, turn that entire monster in the exponent into simply e to the minus something times the variable squared. So let's do that. So let's complete the square. OK, so we have minus i p squared t over 2m plus i p x minus x zero. OK, so the way that I like to complete the square is to isolate my variable. So in this case, p squared by factoring out. So we are going to factor out minus i t over 2m. And that way we get simply p squared. And of course, since we are factoring it out, we need to now adjust this term accordingly. So this would be minus the i is now outside. It still has the p. And there was no 2m here, but we still factor it out. So we need to now multiply by 2m. And we have to divide by t. That way, if we multiply back in, the minus cancel out, the t cancel out, 2m cancels out, and we are back there. So simply x minus x zero. All right. So we have that. Now let's actually do the step of completing the square, right? So let's continue. So we have, have minus i t over 2m. And now we complete the square. So what do we have? We have p minus, we have to divide this by 2 and remove the p. So we have m x minus x 0 divided by t. And this thing squared minus the second term squared. So minus m squared t squared x minus x zero squared. OK, so now we have successfully completed the square. So the exponent that we have up there is equivalent to what we have right here. And now this may not look like much of an improvement, but I promise you it is. So let's now plug it back in. in. So let's see, we have u of t, which is going to be 1 over 2 pi to the sixth. And then we integrate the 3p of e to the all this beast. But we know that that beast is equivalent to this thing right here. So that is e to the minus i t over 2m. And well, now everything else. So this is p minus mt. OK, so now what we're going to do is going to be a change of variables because we are almost there. Even though this looks very, very, very ugly, we are almost there. Why? Because here, if we just multiply through, you're going to see that this is going to get a lot simpler. Let us now just do a, a quick simplification here. Right. So we know that we can separate these to the exponent as if there was an e right here at e to the this power. And so let's multiply through by what was factoring outside. So the minus would cancel out. We get an i here. The squares will cancel out. And we get a factor of 1 half. And with that, we can now lose that big parentheses. And we have now this exponent all by itself outside. So now let's take it out. So now we have e to the i m over 2 t divided by 2 pi over 6. And this is still multiplying by x minus x 0 squared. And now we have, well, all that thing. So then we still have all of this that hasn't gone anywhere. So to turn this now into a Gaussian integral, let's use a change in variable. So let's say v is going to be p minus m over t x minus x 0 squared. And thus dv is simply going to be dp. So that's a pretty easy change in variables. And now let's plug it in. So u 
of t is going to be, well, the exponent in front. And then we integrate now over d, dv. And then we have e to the minus i t over 2m. And now we have this thing squared, which is simply v squared. So now we have been successful and we found a way to write this as a Gaussian integral. Here, right, as a, we can see that b is simply going to be i t over 2m. So that means that u of t is going to be, well, this entire thing again. So, well, and then we have the value of the integral, which is going to be square root of pi over b. So pi over i t over 2m. And we get this thing cubed, right? So cubed because we are integrating in three dimensions, right? Because integral of d3v, right? So we're in three dimensions. So we get one factor of p over b for each direction. Okay, or dimension. Uh, all right, so now we can, well, we can simplify this a little bit further. So let's see. Uh, what we have here is going to be the following. So here, of course, this will now go up. So we have e to the i m over 2 t x minus x zero. Oh, this is squared, by the way. So I almost forgot about that. So this is squared. Uh, this is squared. And this is 2 pi to the sixth. And now let's take a look at this. So here we're going to have 2 m pi divided by i t. And all this is still cubed. Um, so here we could just simplify some of these two, some of the pi factors, but that's not really what we're interested in here, right? What we're interested in is that this is a non-zero factor, right? So we wanted to see if this was zero. After all, what we want to, to see is what is the probability, right, that a particle will go from some point to another in an arbitrarily um, short uh, amount of time? And this is non-zero regardless of what your x is or what your time is. And that is an issue, right? So we will. what this basically implies is that it is possible for particles to communicate with one another faster than the speed of causality or the speed of light, as we usually call it. And that's not good because we know that that is a big, big, big no-no. And we could say, well, maybe this would be fixed if we took the energy to be not just p squared over 2m, but we just say, well, p squared plus m squared, for example, right? If we consider our relativistic energy, that doesn't fix it. So this is the situation in quantum mechanics. We, we, causality is unfortunately not always preserved. So what's going on now in quantum field theory? So now that we have discussed what happened in quantum mechanics, let's now discuss what happens in quantum field theory and how the problem of causality is solved here. So let's begin with the Heisenberg picture. Right? Here the amplitude for a particle to go from some point in space-time y to x is going to be the following. So it begins, this is bra of x ket y, right? So this is nothing particularly new. We can write this, however, as the vacuum and our field acting on it, right? And similarly, we can now have our field act on the vacuum there. So we are just going to write it like this. And we are going to call this, this is going to be our propagator. But so far, just makes sense. Nothing particularly new, uh, mostly the fact that we are now going to uh, be working with fields. So let me quickly remind you what the expression for our fields is. So this right here is what we have found the fields to be. So we just have to plug this in. So this is now d of x minus y. This will be, well, let's plug it in. So we have zero and then we have integral d3p to pi cubed one over square root of two E P and then A P E to the minus I P X plus A P dagger E to the I P X. Let's make sure that this actually looks like a dagger and not like a plus sign. So let's put it over there. All right. And then we have phi 
y, right? So the field in y. Now we have to consider that this can also have a different momentum. So we need to now use a different variable. So this will now be integral d3q to pi cubed and then 1 over square root of 2eq and now we have the same thing here but aq e to the minus i p, a, p sorry not pq so e to the minus i q y and then we have plus a q dagger e to the i q y and of course there's still zero right here okay so now of course doing this calculation would be quite lengthy so let's just take a look at the ap ap dagger aq aq dagger because we know that there are some relations with them and the vacuum right zero here the vacuum so notice the following or remember the following we know that a p the destruction or annihilation operator acting on the vacuum will give us zero and this is of course also true for q and we also know you can basically take the complex conjugate here that the aq dagger and ap dagger in this configuration will also be zero okay so those expressions will be zero so let's take a look at what we get so let's only take a look at so look okay so let's only take a look at those so multiplying the first term with this we get zero ap aq zero aq zero that's zero next then we have ap aq dagger so we have zero ap aq dagger zero now we look at this is is any of these going to be zero it doesn't look like it so so far let's keep it now the next one ap dagger so we have zero ap dagger and then we have aq but this is zero right so this thing right there is zero right right there and well we have that thing again in the next one we have ap dagger aq dagger so this thing here is going to be ap dagger aq dagger but this one right here is zero again so we are only left with this term right there so knowing that saved us a lot of time so let's plug it in so we have dx minus y so then we have vacuum and now come both integrals so we have integral integral so we're integrating d3p d3q and each one has a 2 pi cubed associated with it so just 2 pi to the sixth and then we have 1 over then we have square root of 4 ep eq and then we have now this product so here what what is left only a p a q dagger so only this times this so we have a p e to the minus i p x a q dagger e to the i q y so that's the only one that actually survives so let's maybe move this around so that we get the a's together so this will be a p a q dagger e to the minus i p x plus i q y okay so now maybe let's just change the notation slightly put this inside so let's write it as follows so maybe let's just put the vacuum in there and with that we can now look for an expression for this thing so zero let's put maybe the exponent outside so e to the minus i p x plus i q y and then we have vacuum a p a q dagger and vacuum again so here keep in mind we know uh, a few things about this we know that so maybe let's put it like this so let's say reminder so that this is uh, very clear when i publish the notes later into my patron page so reminder that the commutator here between a p and a q dagger is going to be 2 pi cubed delta cubed of p minus q 
However, uh, keep in mind that a, this commutator is going to be a P, a Q dagger, minus a Q dagger, a P. So you can here uh, basically uh, find what this expression is. So you can see that a P, a Q dagger is going to be, well, this part right here, 2 pi cubed del cubed P minus Q plus a Q dagger a P. So we can now plug it in. And I mean plug it in there, by the way. So that would be e to the minus i p x plus i q y. Then we have the vacuum and then we have this thing. So again, 2 pi cubed del cubed p minus q. And then we're going to have finally this a p a q dagger thing here. Uh, turned it to this, so plus a q dagger a p and then the vacuum again. But a p acting on the vacuum will be zero, so this part will be zero, so that's why this is helpful. And finally we get simply a number, so this means that we get the following, so we get e to the minus blah blah blah, this entire thing, plus i q y, and then we get 2 pi cubed del cubed p minus q and then simply the vacuum uh, right there which is one right okay so now let's plug that back into the blue part so let's plug it back or plug it in so with that we get dx minus y that would be double integral d3p and now comes this thing. So e to the minus i p x plus i q y 2 pi cubed del cubed p minus q. Okay, so now we apply the Dirac delta, which will kill one of the integrals. You can choose whichever one you like, but we usually stay with the p. Uh, no particular reason. That's just kind of what everybody does. So let's do it so that we get the, the result uh, the way that it appears in the books. So by doing that, we kill the Q integral. So now we have D3P, right? We, we basically say the integral sums over every single value of Q. But now we say, wait, the only valid value for Q is P. So that's the reason why the delta kills the integral, at least in a conceptual way that's not a mathematical, a mathematical proof uh, by any means. So 2 pi to the sixth simplifies with this. So we get 2 pi cubed, then we have 1 over 2, EP and EQ are the same now, so we get it squared inside a square root, so we simply get EP, and then we have E to the minus IP, right, that's a P now as well, X minus Y. Okay, and this beautiful expression here is going to be our beautiful propagator for the free Klein-Gordon theory, so write it down, uh, that's, this is the propagator propagator for free Klein-Gordon theory, all right? So this expression right here is Lorentz invariant, and we now want to, I mean, we can maybe show that in another video if there's interest, I don't want to take too long here, um, but now we want to actually study causality, right? We want to use this to study causality. So let's start thinking of a few cases. So what we were saying, like keep this in mind, the whole premise here, we said, well, this propagator here is the basically the, the amplitude, right? The probability that a particle will go from y to x. That's what we said. Okay, keep that in mind. Now let's go for um, a, a particular case of x minus y. So let's say that x0 minus y0 is going to be t and x minus y is going to be 0. So what we are saying is that the, the separator here is simply time-like, okay? That's what we're saying. Um, so let's plug it in. So here we would get dx minus y, maybe let's write it here, time-like. And let's see, this would be d3p, that doesn't really change, 2 pi cubed, 1 over 2 ep. And now here we have e to the minus i. Now keep in mind this, these were four vectors at some point. Now this is simply p0, x0 minus y0. 
Now, what is this? So let me uh, quickly write it. So here we have e to the minus i, p0 is going to be the energy, right, e p, and x0 minus y0 is what we said is t. So that is the first simplification. And now let's try to actually uh, work, our, work with this integral, try to get it to a, a better form. So here we are going to now solve this in spherical coordinates. So let's go to spherical coordinates. So we will get a factor of 4 pi. And because of the integral that goes from 0 to pi, 0 to 2 pi of sine, right? The one that we always get in spherical coordinates. So dx minus y. And that will give us the following. So this is going to be, let's see. So this is no longer d3p. Now we have a 4 pi out here, 2 pi cubed. And what else do we have? We have integral of dp p squared, right, p squared, because we are now in spherical coordinates. So I'm going to just put a link of uh, an arrow there because it's spherical coordinates. And maybe the four pi there as well. And what else do we have? We still have this factor of two e p and then e to the minus i e p t. And of course, this integral now goes from zero to infinity. Okay, so now what we're going to do is that instead of solving this integral uh, with respect to p, we're going to do a change of variable and do it with the energy. So we're going to find a connection between energy and momentum, which we already know, right? We know that EP, so maybe let's write it here, change of variables, change of variables. So let's do it like that. And with this change of variables, we get that this is p squared plus m squared. And thus we can find that uh, p squared is going to be the energy squared minus m squared. Um, so we can now find the differential. So 2p dp is going to be 2ep dep. And well, the twos cancel out, of course. So this and this cancel out. And we can now uh, plug it in. So let's see. So this two will cancel out with that and we get 2 pi over 2 pi cubed, so 1 over 2 pi squared. Now our integral, when it used to be 0, right, when p is 0, now we are at m. So we're now integrating from m to infinity. So m to infinity of dep, right, p dp is ep dep. So one of those p's goes away, we have ep, but we still have one p left e to the minus i e p t and we now divide this by e p so the e p's cancel out and we now want to f uh, replace that p so this is going to be and now what is p well the square root of e p squared minus m squared and then e to the minus i e p t uh, okay, so now this is the integral that we uh, have to evaluate, basically. Unfortunately, this is not really easy. This is going to be a Bessel function, and it's really nasty. I went through the process, and honestly, I do not believe that it will bring particularly much. It is way too much trouble for what we're doing. So what we are going to care about is what happens as t goes to infinity. So basically, that's what we care about, not necessarily to solve the integral, but to understand what happens as t goes to infinity. So as t goes to infinity, this entire integral will go as e to the minus i m t. And the point of this is that it is exponentially decaying or decreasing or vanishing but non-zero. So that is very, very, very important. So even in this case, we do not get a zero probability that when a particle goes from y to x in this time-like situation, that it, it, it will not propagate in an arbitrarily short period of time. So that is not good. We wanted this to be zero, and it wasn't. So that's an issue. 
let's go for another case. So now let's go for a space-like case. So this time we'll get that vector x minus vector y is going to be non-zero. So this is going to be r. And x0 minus y0 is going to be zero. Right? So this is another case. So another case. So let's just quickly plug it in. So dx minus y integral d3p over 2 pi cubed 1 over 2ep. And this time we have e to the i p r. Okay, so what we're going to do now is the following. So we want to do now the dot product between p and r. This will be something for which we need to define our, uh, our axis, basically. So let's choose our axis. Let's basically do a rotation in such a way that this will be p, right? So vector p dot vector r will be the magnitude of p times the magnitude of r times the cosine of the angle in between, which will be uh, p theta. And let's just uh, align our vector r with the z axis so that this angle right here will correspond to just the, the angle that we will use in the integration. So that is the whole point here. So we will now go again to spherical coordinates. So we will uh, choose axis such that we get this. And now we do spherical coordinates. So spherical coordinates. Um, okay, so we have dx minus y. Maybe I'll just quickly write this down without the spherical coordinates and then I will include them. So e to the now i p r. So this would be i p r cosine of p theta. And now let's uh, let's actually do the switch. So here with red there. So with this we get integral. So first we have a factor of 2 pi, right? A factor of 2 pi because uh, we have no sort of uh, phi here. The integral from 0 to 2 pi can just, it's just 2 pi. Then we have integral from 0 to infinity, integral from 0 to pi, and maybe let's separate them a little bit. So from 0 to infinity we have dp, and this would be 2, well, the factor 2 pi cube. <coughs> one over two e p. And then we have integral from zero to um, pi of, and keep in mind, we have this factor of p squared now because we are integrating in spherical coordinates. That's like the r squared sine, right? And in fact, now comes the sine. So we have sine of p theta e to the i p r cosine p theta and we're integrating with respect to p theta here. Okay, so now we want to do that integral. So this right here, uh, use, we can see that sine is the derivative of what is up there. So just use u equal to i p r cosine of uh, p theta. So that means that du is going to be minus i p r sine of p theta, d p theta. Um, so we need to divide this by minus i p r. So now our limits change. So when p theta is zero, cosine is one, so we get i p r. And when we are at pi, it's going to be minus i p r. Then we have, um, let's see, so this will be du over minus i p r e to the i, uh, sorry, this now would be e to the u, so e u. So now let's uh, solve this. So we get one over two, two pi squared. Let's also take the r outside. 
And this i, let's write it up here as minus i. Okay, then we have integral from zero to infinity of dp. Now, one of these p's will cancel out with that one. So we get dp times p divided by two ep. And then we have, well, the integral of the exponential is just itself. So let's evaluate this. Um, and keep in mind, we have still a minus sign down here. Okay, so we haven't forgotten about that. So we have e to the u evaluated at minus ipr. So e to the minus ipr minus e to the ipr and all of this divided by minus one. Okay, so now again, use that ep is equal to square root of p squared plus m squared, because now we want to start looking at this integral. And we will also separate both integrals. So we will do, we'll apply this minus sign and separate the integrals. So by doing that, we get dpp divided by two square root of p squared plus m squared. And then we have e to the minus ipr with a minus sign in front. Uh, actually, maybe let's take the positive first. So this is going to be e to the ipr. And then we have minus the integral from zero to infinity of the p times p divided by two. Um, actually, this two we already took outside. I just noticed. So we, I was considering it twice. So thank God I noticed. <laughs> okay, so that's um, square root of p squared plus m squared. And then we have e to the minus i p r. Now we can have p go to minus p in the second integral. And when we do that, we are going to get the following. So let me maybe just quickly copy paste this so that I don't have to do it again. Now we are going to get a minus because of this p. So we get plus. And here we get e to the plus i p r. And now we're going to basically be going not from zero to infinity. So by doing that, we're basically changing from minus infinity all the way to zero. And now we have the exact same thing on both integrals and we can just add them together. So we get integral minus i two two pi squared uh, r, r is down here. And we have two pi, uh, sorry, integral zero to, no longer zero to infinity. So now we're going from minus infinity to infinity, dpp e to the i p r over square root of p squared plus m squared. So this integral now is very fun to engage with, um, but again, it really goes beyond what we are going to do. The procedure here um, is to use the Cauchy theorem and eventually we'll end up at another Bessel function. And I don't think we get too much. In case you want to go there, I want to give you here the first steps. Um, because again, I don't think it really makes any pedagogical sense to go there. And the point is, once again, that as r goes to infinity, what we will have is the following. We will have that this expression will go as e to the minus mr. And that is also non-zero. And that, that's weird, right? Because we thought that we were going to solve the causality problem in quantum field theory. We were looking at the probability that a particle, right, going from y to x, uh, what would be, the, be the, the amplitude in this exchange? So it turns out that we are not really uh, prohibiting basically faster than, than light communication here. So what's going on? Well, the main thing was that we were not really asking the right question. And this is where the, the big difference between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory starts to come into play. Because we were asking about the probability that a particle will go from point y to x in a certain time. That's what we were asking. And we found that it could never it, it could always get there in a in our very, very small time. But in reality, what we should be asking 
is what is the probability that a measurement performed at one spot will be able to influence another measurement. Basically, we want to know what the commutator is, right? We care now about the commutator, not just about the probability. And the main difference here is going to be the following. Now, keep in mind, we know that this is zero when we have equal times, right? We know the equal time commutation relations, but we are going to consider this in general. So don't consider that the, the times are equal here. So keep in mind our expression for the fields that we found before. I'm just going to quickly remind you so that we can do this. So we know So here, let's just quickly um, go ahead and write this. So this would be, whew, take a take a breather. So this would be, uh, let's see, maybe let's do it like this. So we have that phi of x, phi of y uh, is going to be equal to, of course, phi x, phi y minus phi y, phi x. So here we are going to do maybe one of these calculations and then just change x for y in the other because why would we do the same thing twice? And in fact, phi x phi y is something that we have kind of done in the past, right? We did it, uh, let me see if I can find it, how long ago was it, right here. Phi x phi y. We had this thing except for the a vacuum outside of it here. So let's calculate this knowing um, what phi of x and phi of y are. I just went ahead and copied a uh, phi x times phi y from what we used before, but here in blue you have phi x, in red phi y. So we have this and then we have minus this same expression but the other way around. So let me just take a moment to now multiply through. So we have integral another integral d3p 2 pi to the sixth, one over the square root of, well, four, e p e q. So this looks a lot like what we had before, but now we don't have the vacuum to help us. So now we multiply through. So we have a p a q e to the minus i p x minus i q y. And then we have plus a p a q dagger e to the minus i p x plus i q y now we go for this and this so that would be plus a p dagger uh, a q e to the minus or rather plus i p x minus i q y and finally we have plus a p dagger a q dagger and we have e to the i p x e to the i q y okay now let's do the same but for phi y so phi y phi x so this will be the same thing but we are going to have to just quickly swap out the x and the y's Okay, so now just like before, we are going to multiply through. So this would be, well, now we have a double integral. Oh, I just realized I missed the d3q earlier. Um, d3p, d3q, 2 pi to the sixth. And then what do we have? We have 1 over square root of 4 e p e q. So that part, of course, is not different from what we had before. And now comes this product. So here we have a q a p e to the minus i q y minus i p x. And then we go for the next one. So then we have plus a q. So a q a p dagger e to the minus i q y plus i p x plus a q dagger a p e to the i q y e to the uh, sorry <laughs> uh, minus i p x 
And finally, we have a Q dagger, a P dagger, E to the I Q Y plus I P X. There we go. And now we are going to actually take a look at the commutator, which means subtracting these two. So phi X comma phi Y means to subtract these two. So phi of X, phi Y minus phi Y, phi X. So let's take a look at them. So of course we're interested, um, we have all the integral terms, right? So integral, but let's take a look at the interesting part. So all the creation destruction operators. So here we have AP, AQ, AQ, AP, and then the same thing. So we get AP, AQ, minus AQ, AP, and all of this times e to the minus i p x minus i q y. And this is nothing else than the commutator of a p and a q. And now what is that as you might recall? It is zero, of course. So um, let's see what do we have next. So we already took care of this and of this. So then we have this part, a p a q dagger. So we have plus a p a q dagger minus this part, which is a q dagger a p. And let's see, they are both multiplied by i q y minus i p x. So e to the minus i p x plus i q y. And this thing right here is the commutator of a p and a q dagger. Now this thing is going to be 2 pi cubed delta cubed of p minus q as we saw before. And let's see, what else do we have? Then we have, so we consider this, now we need to go for this term. So that would be plus, this is a p dagger a q minus, now we go down here, a q, a p dagger. And this is all multiplied by e to the minus i q i i p x. Yes, just double checking that this all works out. And then we have the, this would be the commutator of a p dagger, comma, and this would be a q. So this is the same as minus the commutator of a q, a p dagger, and we know what this is. This is simply going to be minus 2 pi cubed del cubed of p minus q, or q minus p, doesn't matter. Okay, and then finally we have one more term. So this is going to be um, a p dagger, a q dagger, well, that's going to be zero, right? Zero, why? Well, because uh, the commutator of a p dagger a q dagger, well, that's simply going to be zero. So I just made it a little bit faster. Okay, so knowing all that, what do we get? We get the following. So let's go back here. We get the integral and all of these monsters. So double integral d3 p d3 q 2 pi to the sixth 1 over square root of 4 e p e q. And now come the surviving terms here. So the only things that survived is a 2 pi cubed del cubed p minus q and then e to the minus i p x plus i q y minus again 2 pi cubed del cubed p minus q e to the i p x minus i q y. All right. And all this is going to be integral of d 3 p over 2 pi cubed. And then since p and q are the same, we get 2 e p. And finally, here we have e to the minus i p x minus y minus e to the, and here we have uh, i p x minus y.
Phew, okay, that's pretty nice. So what do we do with this, right? Now, take a moment to look at this and also to look at our previous results. So this might be a little bit further up. Um, here, when we discuss the propagator, the 3p 2 pi cubed 1 over 2 ep e to the minus i p x minus y. So what we ended up getting is actually, so this thing right here, which again is the commutator phi x phi y, this thing is dx minus y minus d, uh, this would be dx minus y, uh, here we have to factor out uh, a minus sign so that it looks like it was before. So let's factor a minus sign here so that we get y minus x and that way it looks uh, like what, what we had up there. So it will, this would be minus the y minus x. And this doesn't seem to be zero immediately until we remember that these are Lorentz invariants. So Lorentz in variant. And in our case, we can do a transformation that brings y minus x to x minus y. So that this thing is going to be dx minus y minus d, uh, and here x minus y, right? Each one is separately Lorentz in the, uh, invariant. So they ended up cancelling out and we get zero, which is exactly what we wanted, what we care about, because what matters is precisely this, that one measurement in quantum field theory cannot possibly uh, affect another at any arbitrary distance, right? It must respect, uh, causality must be preserved and that is pretty good. But this also shines light on a very interesting uh, thing. So to understand this better, Let's go for, you know, an interesting case. In the case where this field creates positively charged particles and thus destroys negatively charged particle, while this one does the inverse, right? So this one does precisely the inverse. So if we look at what we had at this expression, right? Basically what we were saying is that we have a particle traveling from y to x and also from x to y. And in the case, right, when we have that our two fields are, which will be what we will see uh, very shortly when we take the complex field, in this case, it was just a real field, right? Um, so what we are considering now is that phi dagger of x is equal to phi of x, right? So that's what we are saying right now. But it, later we're going to uh, just also allow it to be a complex field. So now if we have phi dagger of y, now that's going to be very interesting because what this is going to end up doing is that it's going to be creating, rather it's going to be a particle being transmitted one way and it's anti-particle being transmitted the other. And that is what allows causality to be preserved. And that's very interesting because antiparticles arise naturally in quantum field theory and not only naturally, but antiparticles are actually the reason why causality is preserved, right? It is interconnected. Without antiparticles, quantum field theory could not preserve causality. And that I think is very interesting. Now you might say, well, what's going on in free Klein-Gordon theory? Well, in our case, it simply happens that um, our particle is its own antiparticle, right? Which we know there are cases of, such as the photon, for example. Um, so that's quite interesting, I'd say, right? So that is the main conclusion. That was the problem in quantum mechanics. This is uh, something that you must consider. We sh we cannot ever really consider a single particle framework because the the nature of communication, right, between events is multi-particle. So we have to work with a multi-particle framework, which is precisely why we are working in quantum field theory. So there we go. I hope that this video was useful to you. If it was, please, you know, leave a like on the, on, on the video, comment and subscribe. 
and maybe consider checking out my Patreon. I will have the lecture notes of this and all following videos in there. So you know, consider supporting me there and you will also have access to the lecture notes. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in another video.